What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Supper Suite at TIFF 2022. I've got the team behind Muru here. Huge congratulations. I don't know. I I just started the movie. I didn't I didn't realize how ambitious you were gonna get as things progressed. It is like I mean, a, like a Hollywood level action film with obviously a lot more to the story than just that. But I was very very impressed by the production value of this movie. Thank you. Right on. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I will start with you. And I will ask you to do something that I have a feeling a million people are going to ask you to do today. Can you give us a brief description of what Muru is about for anybody out there who has not heard of this film yet? Well, Muru is a story that encapsulates 100 years of history in terms of the government's relationship with a special tribe called Tuhoi back in New Zealand. And the film is about a day emblematic of this relationship where the government decided to push a red button on this community saying there were terrorists here. So to my left, I have Cliff Curtis, who plays the, the local police sergeant who's sort of torn between loyalties of, do I serve the badge or do I protect my community? And right here, Mr. J. Ryan, he plays Captain Gallagher, and he is a man with a seed of doubt given this order from the chain of command above him. And he is the seed of doubt. And by the end of the film, he's basically a new man with a new realization. All right, to follow up on that and add a little more to it, can you tell us a little bit about some of the truth that inspired what we see in the film, but then also what inspired this, the decision to make this a reaction rather than a recreation of those past events? Because I feel like, you know, a lot of more traditional films out there would have gone that route. We did a lot of research. We've done, we've, we've got a lot of relationships here just sitting on this one chair, on this one sofa. And this research, it, it led us to this pathway. The government en enacted a raid against this community. And by raid, we say they brought in the STG. They treated it like a black op uh, operation in terms of domestic terrorists live here. And that wasn't the case. So the inspiration behind creating the film and creating a response to this film uh, and to the raid is actually about lifting the truth, demasking power, seeing who these people truly were, seeing who this community and iwi and tribe truly are, beyond the headlines that seem to snapshot us and encapsulate what happened on this one day. It's incredibly powerful. The first thing I did after I finished the movie was obviously go down the rabbit hole of Googling everything. Right, right, right. I, I mean, that should be like the intended effect of this movie. And I think it's going to have that impact on a lot of people. Right, yeah. It's a big rabbit hole. It's a deep rabbit hole. And this, this, why we chose to respond is to get beyond that, to get beyond uh, the simple headline and, and into the lives and relationships that really define these people, not the gov government's action against them. I feel like this so is there's, a lot to, there's a lot to discover. I feel like this is just me blabbing about how much I love your movie, but the other quality I love about it is how many, how many different characters we're allowed access to, where whether you could classify someone as good, bad, or something in between, I understand what's motivating every single person, and it draws a newcomer to this situation deeper into the material with a better understanding of it. I'm very impressed. Thank you. I just, I just like reviewed your movie right to your face. <laughs> I mean it though. For the two of you, I know you've been working on the idea for this movie for a little while now. What would you say is the biggest difference for the first way you envision this movie playing out compared to what we wind up seeing in the final film? All your questions are great. And in terms of, you know, defining and drawing these characters and the arcs that they all travel, it's, it's, it was important for us to get way beyond the black and white headline into this gray area, into this human area, into this, this place of discovery for each of our characters who are on this chessboard. And it's a big chessboard because this is a deep, rich valley and community. In terms of the original draft, well, it was very faithful, uh, faithful to a small snapshot. And what we were able to do with a lot of direction from Tuhoi themselves and each other was, <sighs> was create more context, give deeper understanding and, um, and really color and shade the full relationship. Now, whether we achieve that in a hundred minutes, I'd, I'd like to think we got very, very close. We certainly aim to. I'm very impressed by how much you achieve in a hundred minutes. Uh, Cliff, for you specifically with Taffy, even having been involved in the development of the project for so long, is there anything you discovered about the character that you weren't able to tap into until you hit set, 
working with your scene partners and in that environment? Uh, another great question. Another great question. Um, uh, I'm still affected by the your opening questions in terms of I'm trying to wrap it up into a single answer. I think like we're indigenous storytellers. So in terms of indigenous being the native people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and this is a this is a story on the impact of being indigenous in our own country, and then wrapping it up in a cin cinematic kind of gift to our audience, trying to get it into that 100 minutes in a way that's like worthy of cinema, right? Um, which means that we got into the into the area of storytelling, which we call allegory, where we look at society and we look at the patterns of society, and we look at say, where is there a lesson here? Is there something that we can that we can learn about who we are as human beings? And I think in terms of indigenous storytelling, what's interesting to me is what you touched on with that very lovely com uh, compliment. Really, is that uh, the traditional storytelling style is um, protagonist antagonist good, bad, right, wrong, good, evil, right? Indigenous, story, indigenous storytelling is, is somewhat more complex. It's about families and communities. It's not about the individual. And I think structurally what Tiaripa really offers as an indigenous storyteller is, is getting into, with my character, I got my class two license so I could drive a bus. <laughs> my first two days on set is I had to drive a bus with children, real children from that community and his own children in the bus. My first day on set on a live road in a remote location with real cars. And then my next scene, I had to have the elders of that community in the bus, you know. And, and then it was when, bring in the helicopter. And then bring in the helicopter and coordinate all of that. So what I discovered is simultaneously is um, the exhilaration of making a movie that's going to, have a sense of action and be in the community, in the valley, on location, very remote during COVID, but uh, being responsible to this community, actually metaphorically as a storyteller, driving the bus with that community while acting on screen and handling the wheel, driving, driving the story. So I don't think I could think of a more visceral way to experience the movie than that yeah it's pretty Cliff, great you're gonna drive a bus bro you're gonna be a cop but a cop that the world has never seen you're gonna be driving a live bus with elders community elders tribal literally, elders literally and tamariki, the all our children and the elders in that bus were there during the real raids right so we're reenacting parts of their lives for them you know we were recreating parts of their lives for them in a fictional sort of like allegorical tale wrapped up in cinema so I've been a, it's been a great, great journey. It's so exciting to be here, you know, to present this at Toronto and, and to a world and, and to sort of bring our indigenous storytelling uh, flows and styles uh, to, to cinema. Yeah. You're doing it in a big way right now. It was Thank well you, worth yeah. getting that bus license. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, He's it's got it in his pocket. I got it in my pocket. It was a condition. He carries it all the time. Anyway. You ain't getting this role unless you I, get I, this driver's I license. You couldn't do it any other way. There's That's no so funny. Way to do it, but yeah. I okay. love that you have it on you. There's my license. And Proof. The back. Proof. The, there on the back, that big picture, that's a bus. So yeah. Okay. I'm a okay. bus driver. He could now. do bus tours around Toronto right now. And we'd all jump on and we'd all have <laughs> a good you, time. If you ever Tip do tour. that, I will be your first customer. Sign me up for that. Okay. <laughs> um, Jay, a question for you. I'm actually going to borrow uh, Tiarapa's words from a different interview. I don't know if this is the case for you, but he said that. After you all did a, a table read of the script, that the reaction from the cast was great trepidation. Did you feel that yourself? And if so, why was that the case? Yeah, no, actually, there was a great silence of what we just read and experienced and heard amongst each other for the first time, hearing it out loud come off the page. I remember when I read the script for the first time, I think two pages in, I was in awe. I hadn't even read any dialogue or scene work yet. It was just sort of the statements up the front. And the statement was that, you know, this uh, event happened in 2007, but it also happened 100 years before this and another 100 years before that. So this is an ongoing history between these people of Tuhoi and the Crown. Um, so for me to learn that history within a couple of pages was, was quite shocking. And I, I felt the weight of what we're about to, to go in and do. 
also for a New Zealand film to have all of these aspects, like you say, it has the scope of a Hollywood um, blockbuster, but with a real depth. Um, so to be able to do that justice, I mean, I didn't really know T or Cliff at the time before we went in. So um, yeah, we, we all put our armor on and went to work brought up to Hawaii a couple times now. Would you mind just so our audience knows who they are, but also, again, you accomplish a whole lot in a hundred minutes of a running time, but are there any small details about the history and lifestyle there that you would just want people to be aware of, even if it's something that isn't like focused or flat out discussed in the film? It's a very remote community and in, in, in what we call the Whārua, this valley, this deep valley. Uh, where a river runs down through the valley and out to the ocean. And in terms of an indigenous community, it's, uh, it's sort of shrouded in a way, uh, almost myth mythological, and in, in how uh, untouched it is uh, in, some, in some ways. It's a remote community. Not many people go up the valley or too deeply into the valley. You know, these people are resilient. This community has, uh, you know, uh, maintained their language and their way of being um through all of this conflict and it's a it's, it's a very it's a great honor for us as storytellers and filmmakers uh to go in there uh, into that community to be welcomed in and to share that with the world this is a this is a rare rare uh, honor for us to to be a part of that community in that way yeah and tuho is situated basically in the middle of of new zealand of the north island and uh, we, uh, me and Manu Bennett, who plays the other uh, STG cop, we were up in the chopper basically all day long. So we were hovering over the forest and they're so vast and ancient and they crawl and they, they go so high. I mean, it was hard for us to get above the tree line. Um, so it is a very special place. It does have a bit of a unique and mysterious vibe going on to most Kiwis who are outside of it. Um, so to be welcomed in, in into the village and um, the valley was uh, an experience I won't forget. I already got a, a wind I'll, I'll down just, so I'll many just things add I want to ask you. To Tuhoi is that it is the home of Tamaiti. Yes. That's where I wanted to go next. You and gave me a perfect the, segue. And as the home of Tamaiti, we were all so honored and privileged to be welcomed into his backyard. And we all, as, as Māori, owe so much to Tuhoi because of the conflict and the breakdown in relationships their autonomy, their self-independence, their, their language preservation, their tikanga traditional preservation. Every other iwi in New Zealand, Aotearoa, aspires to be honorary tūhoi. Okay, so two follow-ups. I'm determined to squeeze in before they make uh, me let you go. Make me let you guys go. First, uh, Tama Iti. I was reading the production notes, and it seems like almost everyone involved has a really personal connection to him and what he stands for in his work. So, can each of you uh, tell us a little bit about that? But also, I'm very curious. What was it like approaching him to play himself in the movie? Was he totally game to do it, or was there any apprehension? Uh, I'm. No, you start, bro. I mean. Yeah, you, you start. Go, you go. Listen, he's directed you. you, you. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Hang on. I'll prepare well, something earlier. Um, oh, no, for me, T Tame is iconic in New Zealand, um, but many people have different opinions of why he's iconic. And, you know, the 2007 raids, the media really painted a, a dirty picture of the man and, and the people surrounding him um, to fit their rhetoric, you know. So for me, it was to be a part of this was to change that narrative. Um, I was saying to T the other day, my uh, my own father, you know, when I told him I was going to do a movie with Tama Iti, he was like, but isn't that fella like, you know, isn't he guilty? And I was like, no, dad, he's not. And that's why I'm doing the movie. Um, and so when he saw the film recently, he was like, oh, I get it. You know, I get it. So that was, that's all I needed. That was, um, that was my goal uh, in this piece. Yeah. I'll jump in so you can wrap it up. But um yeah, Tamiti, I've known him for decades. I met him as an artist, as a as a sort of like a uh yeah, as an artist, you know. He was he was he had a restaurant, uh, you know. Um he he was he was a DJ uh, in, on a local radio show. Um he he was a painter, uh, you know, he does dance shows. So the notion of you know, and he puts on, you know, politically driven art, for sure, definitely a political activist absolutely but an artist first and foremost 
So the notion that the, that when they created this narrative about him, this alternate universe where he was not these things, uh, I knew that I I was all in for telling this story and sort of saying, okay, we you know this is a story that needs to be told and it needs to be corrected. And in the movie, you'll see him. He also collects honey from bees. And I love that. I did see that. And the suit that. he's wearing in the movie, that's his honey bee collecting suit. <laughs> we'll see it on the runway next season. Okay, I'll leave that to wrap, wrap up for you, bro. Tamaiti and my father are friends. Tamaiti and my father-in-law are friends. We're family friends. Um, but it was still a task to give him the confidence to know that he could stand alongside Cliff Curtis, Jay Ryan, Simone Kessel, Manu Bennett, and this big this big community, you know, and this and to, the telling of this big story. But all the words were his words. All the dialogue came from him. All the thought track came from him. So we had a read. He rung me up and he said, Arepa, I can do this. All right, someone's about to glare at me, but I'm asking one more question because you brought up Tikana. You saw it, it happened. Um, the last person I spoke to about that was Rachel House, and I, I hear about it, and it's it just seems like something that is very specific to that region, but it's something that literally every set on this planet could benefit from embracing. So can you tell us a little bit about something that that adds to the on-set environment that you wish you saw in more productions out there? I mean, it really comes down to respectfulness. And if you walk into someone's house, if you walked in someone's like front yard or backyard into the into their world, whatever it is, it's about being respectful of who you are and whose environment you're walking into. If you walk into someone else's environment um, and bring all of yourself into that without respecting where you are, that's really the most general broad term of what I could determine tikanga is because we all have our own homes. We all have our own ways of being and it's really about being respectful and about respecting that what happens in your house when I'm in your house, respecting what happens in your house um, and what happens in your front or backyard and respecting you as a human being, uh, really knowing your family or, or your community to like go in with a predetermined, predisposed idea about who you are and what you are, disrespectfully, that's not tikanga. That's the opposite of. To add to that, we shot this film in 29 days. And we did not shoot this film on a film set. We shot this in their whare, in their house, in their whārua, in their valley. And the only way that we could accomplish that ridiculous, unattainable schedule is because of the support and respect that we had. Tikanga is about empowering the person, empowering the community, empowering the storytellers, empowering the participants. It's the, it's, it says that we are going to choose a way to do it, and this is the right way. So Tikanga is also about bringing Tuhoi to Toronto. And we've brought Aroha Teapa with us, who was a kuya who was there, She's one of our tribal elders. She is a tūhoi rangatira, and she has come to Toronto with us because that is also tikanga. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> I have to let you all go. I could talk about your, I, 29 days, 29 days. Yeah, that's true. Huge, huge, huge congratulations on what you accomplished. I hope you have a wonderful time celebrating it at the festival. To everybody out there, thank you so much for watching this interview about Muru. Check it out. Do not miss it. And we will be back soon at the Supper Suite with more TIFF 2022 interviews.